Now let's talk about India in detail. The second wave is growing every day. And frankly, calling it a wave is misleading now. What we are seeing is a tsunami of cases. More than 270,000 were reported on Sunday alone. The government has responded by expanding its vaccine drive. From the 1st of May, every Indian aged 18 plus will be eligible for a vaccine. But herd immunity is still a distant dream. So where are we headed? The numbers have to fall at some point, we know that. But the question is when? What can the government do to crush this curve? And how is the second wave different from the first? Let's look at data first. This is what India's daily caseload looks like. On the 12th of April, India was at 161,000 cases. Six days later, 273,000 cases. We did the math. Look at that graph. This is a 70% surge in less than a week. A 70% increase in cases. So the trajectory is not looking good. And a lot of people are asking, when will India hit the peak? Well, the answer is no one knows. It's like driving up a hill. You know you're past the peak only when you're driving down. Nonetheless, some models have made bold claims and most of them think that May 2021 will be the peak next month. But India has consistently bucked the statisticians. In the first wave, they made doomsday predictions about India and we know that those never materialized. And thank God for that. This year, they said February would mark a decline in cases. The very opposite happened. By the end of February, cases started going up. The fact is, models work under perfect conditions. They do not account for super spreader campaign rallies or mass religious gatherings. These are externalities, aberrations that make projections impossible. India did not plan for the second wave. So it is now reacting to crises as they come. Even the courts are having to step in now. The Allahabad High Court has ordered mini lockdowns in five cities in Uttar Pradesh. And mind you, this is not a court's job. But that's how bad the situation is. The judges are being forced to step in, they say, thanks to the administration's inaction. The most pressing challenge right now is oxygen or the lack of it. How serious is the shortage in India? It doesn't look good. Maharashtra has already reached full capacity. Madhya Pradesh does not have oxygen plants of its own. And states that do not have or do have excess oxygen have no means to transport it. So in a matter of days, the demand for oxygen has shot up by 60%. Remember, the Wuhan virus attacks your lungs. Supplemental oxygen is critical to treating it. A shortage of cylinders can be devastating. So what is the government's plan to deal with this? There are three specific measures that are being implemented. Number one, importing oxygen. The government is looking to buy 50,000 tons of medical oxygen. Number two, a ban on supply to industries. From the 22nd of April, Indian industries will not have access to oxygen. This stock will be diverted to hospitals. And number three, the Oxygen Express. This is a railways initiative. Special trains will transport oxygen cylinders across the country. And this is going to be a game changer for rural India. What about hospital beds? A similar story is unfolding there. We're getting reports of patients being turned away from hospitals. The problem is acute. In New Delhi, the national capital, banquet halls and hotels are being turned into makeshift hospitals. The chief minister says only 100 beds are left in Delhi. So India is still treating patients while the rest of the world is immunizing them. How did we end up here? How did India crush the first wave? and then get swamped by the second. To understand this, we need to compare the two waves. What are the similarities and what are the differences? For instance, does the second wave infect more young people? That's what most people say, but the data does not say so. In both the waves, 70% of patients were aged 40 plus. So the elderly are still the most vulnerable group. What about younger patients? In the first wave, they made up 5.8% of the cases, now 4.2%. And this is not just a medical trend, mind you. It's just that we've opened up schools and public activities. So kids who stayed at home last year were out playing on the streets this year. And that accounts for a lot of these younger cases. What about the symptoms? 
Let's look at the most common one, shortness of breath. In the first wave, 41% of the patients complained of breathlessness. In the second wave, 47.5%. And this trend has extended to the use of supplemental oxygen. 41% patients in the first wave needed oxygen. And this time, that figure has gone up to 54.5%. So more than half the admitted patients are using oxygen cylinders, which is why the shortage is unsettling. But it's not all bad news. India's fatality rate is under control. In fact, it is lower than the first wave so far. Another feature of this second surge has been false negatives. You take a test, it comes out negative, but you may actually be infected. Why is this happening? Some reports blame RT-PCR tests. Initially, it was said that virus mutations may mislead tests, giving you a negative result. But the government of India has dismissed this report. It says that RT-PCR can catch all mutations, provided the test is done right. And if that's the case, why are so many false negatives popping up? One possible reason is shoddy testing. You see, clinics are swamped with people right now. The demand has shot up. And collecting swabs is a delicate task. Not everyone has got the perfect training. So what's the big takeaway here? India relaxed at the wrong moment. The masks and social distancing disappeared when the vaccines arrived. In contrast, that was the time to put our heads down. India missed a golden chance to crush the pandemic. We're seeing a success story slowly unravel, thanks to a lack of foresight. Weon is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.